Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, preaching to the Galatians. Acts chapter 14, verses 1 to 7, at Iconium. The 80 miles or 130 kilometre journey from Antioch to Iconium would take several days. Iconium is a similar height above sea level as Antioch, about 1,100 metres, and therefore has a suitable climate for someone susceptible to malaria. This was Paul's thorn, Greek sharp stake, in the flesh. He mentions in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. Paul was now about 40 years of age. Once again, preaching commenced in the synagogue, presumably on a Sabbath. Initially, great success followed their preaching, for a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But success led to Jewish opposition and jealousy once again, as it had in Acts 13 and verse 45. And the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles. Some Jews seem to have had considerable influence in the Roman world at that time. Because wives of the principal men of a city frequently became proselytes. Judaism was a much more desirable way of life than the gross immorality of idolatry and therefore appealed to these women. These were the devout and honourable women through whom Jewish influence could be all the more dangerous. Chapter 13, verse 15, and chapter 17, verse 4, and verse 12. They had both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins all way. 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 15 and 16. Nevertheless, Paul and Barnabas boldly continued giving testimony to the word of his grace for a long time, probably over several weeks. In answer to prayer, the Lord granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. These miracles confirmed the word of his grace and prevented any early outbreak of violence. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. Grace is opposite to law. This grace, the Greek word charis, is not a miraculous spirit gift, but salvation. For by grace, charis, are ye saved through faith. We see in Ephesians 20, verse 32, and Ephesians 2, verse 8. Interestingly, Paul and Barnabas are referred to as apostles, though they were not of the twelve. Sadly, the division provoked by the Jews eventually resulted in violence and an attempt by the Jews to stone them. As a result, it became necessary to flee from Iconium, not because of cowardice, but because of the prudence recommended by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 10, verse 23. They fled from the region of Pisidia to Lystra and Derbe in Lycaonia, and there they preached the gospel. Acts chapter 14, verse 7 to 20, at Lystra. Lystra was at the limits of Greek culture and influence. Paul did not normally preach beyond the point where some education made for easier understanding of God's word, and where Roman rule gave order and security. At Lystra there was no synagogue but a man impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked, had faith to be healed. Here Luke's threefold emphasis on the man's physical disability serves to highlight the nature of the healing when it came. Of course, the Lord had also healed an impotent man at the pool of Bethesda, who had not walked for thirty-eight years, in John 5. And Peter had healed a lame man who had never walked at the beautiful gate of the temple, 
in Acts chapter 3. As with this man at Lystra, their faith had been confirmed by their healing. This man also leaped and walked, even though, unlike us, he had never learned to walk. The power of the miracle could not be gainsaid, and the people knew it. In the speech of Lycaonia, which neither Paul nor Barnabas understood, they said, The gods are come down unto us in the likeness of men. They called Barnabas Jupiter, the father or chief of the gods, which is probably an indication of Barnabas' age. Paul they called Mercurius, the messenger of the gods, because he was the chief speaker. The Revised Version correctly uses the alternative names of Zeus and Hermes. Later Paul was to write to the Galatians and remind them, My temptation which was in my flesh ye despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, in Galatians 4 verse 14. There was probably a temple to Jupiter just outside the city where preparations began for sacrifices to be made. On realising what was happening, the two apostles rent their clothes in protest, something no god would do. Then Paul, no doubt using the gift of tongues, cried out, Sirs, why do ye such things? His words, turn from these vanities, was hardly tactful but necessary under the circumstances. Straight to the point and perfectly scriptural. Deuteronomy 32 verse 21 We marvel at how the Apostle is able to turn an ugly incident into an opportunity to preach the Gospel. Luke faithfully records this as an example of how, if we are scripturally prepared, just about any event can be made into a springboard to launch into the gospel. Since there were no scriptures held by the people that Paul could refer to, then he must preach without them. How could such a thing be done? In fact, Paul's argument was firmly based on the Old Testament, though no direct quotation or reference to Jewish history was possible under the circumstances. He appealed to the works of creation to prove the existence of a God higher than any they held in esteem. It is vanity to worship something less than oneself. Paul based his remarks on Psalm 146. Happy is he that hath the God of Israel for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God which made heaven and earth, the sea and all that therein is, which keepeth truth for ever. Psalm 146 verses 5 to 6 What is more, says Paul, he is the living God. Otherwise the benefits of rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness would have failed. And filling our hearts with food and gladness is certainly something evolution cannot do. In fact, the failure of evolution is evident in that increasingly it has to be supported by legislation lest the logic of creation or intelligent design wins the debate. A summary of Paul's speech at Lystra. Paul and Barnabas were not gods, but men. The power to heal came from the living God, and with that we can compare Acts 3, verse 12 to 16. Their mission was to turn men from idolatry to serve the living God. He is the Creator. He has allowed men to walk in their own ways, but now appeals to them to turn None but he is to be worshipped. Evidence of the Creator is seen in fruitful seasons, etc. As we read from Psalm 24, verse 1, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. And Psalm 104, verses 13 to 15, and so on. The people no doubt felt foolish and humiliated. 
Under the circumstances, it was easy for Jews arriving from Antioch and Iconium to persuade the people to stone Paul. These Jews had travelled a long way just to make trouble. It is an indication of the depth of their hatred that they were prepared to compass sea and land for such a purpose. Matthew 23, verse 15. Paul was cruelly stoned, a Jewish method of execution, dragged out of a city and left for dead. That Paul rose up, the Greek anistemi, to stand up before the disciples, not only indicates that progress had been made in preaching, for now they were disciples in Lystra, but that his amazing recovery was surely a miracle. It was a type of death and resurrection that probably made Paul feel a little better about his involvement in the death of Stephen, now that he could share the like suffering. He was later to write to them, Who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? In Galatians 3 verse 1. He wrote similarly to the Corinthian Ecclesia, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body, in the second of Corinthians 4 verse 10, and he uses the phrase, in deaths oft, in the first of Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23. Amongst those who believed and formed the new ecclesia were Timothy and his family. We have them mentioned in Acts 16, verses 1 to 2. Timothy was a highly thought of young brother who was to become my own son in the faith. To him Paul would write, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In the first of Timothy chapter 1 verse 2 and the second of Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. And Timothy knew exactly what this meant from the very first because of Paul's own example. He also wrote to Timothy, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The second of Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. What courage! What faith! What love for the infant Ecclesia it took for Paul to straightway go back into the city and then to return again shortly after. Paul's recovery from his injuries must have been a miracle for him to be able to leave the next day for Derby, even if the stoning did not actually kill him. At Derby he taught many, and yet another new ecclesia began. One member was Brother Gaius, who travelled later with Paul to Jerusalem, as we read in chapter 20, verse 4. But Paul and Barnabas had gone far enough. It was time to return to Antioch and report to the Ecclesia, lest worry about their safety became acute after such a long absence. They returned by the same route as their outward journey, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. In each of the young Ecclesias this happened. To return via Lystra, where Paul had been stoned, Iconium, where they had been assaulted, and Antioch in Pisidia, where they had been persecuted and expelled, was an extraordinarily brave act by the two faithful preachers. Through much tribulation. Life in the truth has its difficulties though we're tending to settle for a more comfortable life today. But if we continue in the faith, then we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom. The Lord gave the same warning when he said, But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. 
Even so, Paul adds, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Romans 8 verse 18. He wrote that no man should be moved by these afflictions in the first of Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 2 to 4, but rather rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. The first of Peter chapter 4 verse 12 to 16. The redeemed will have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, Christ said in Revelation chapter 7. Our tribulations are generally subtler than in these last days when perilous times have come. Therefore, take heed, watch ye therefore, and pray always, Paul says in the second Timothy chapter 3 verse 2 to 4. It is necessary that we exhort one another to continue in the faith and support each other, for even the Lord learned obedience by the things that he suffered, Paul says in Hebrews 5 verse 8. We need each other. To isolate ourselves from the brethren will certainly lead to our failure. In Paul's time the exhortation was necessary because the ecclesias were soon to be overwhelmed by Judaizers with their false teaching of circumcision and keeping of law, as we see in Galatians. Paul and Barnabas ordained elders in each ecclesia and prayed with fasting because the responsibility of the work in a hostile city would be great. And bear in mind that the Old Testament was not in general circulation and the New Testament had not then been completed. From Luke's brief comment, another insight is given into the structure of the early ecclesias. Elders appointed to have the oversight of an ecclesia must have a constitution to work to. There is precedent for this throughout Scripture. Samuel had written the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book, the first of Samuel 10 verse 25. David had enlarged Samuel's constitution in preparation for the addition of a temple in the first of Chronicles chapter 9 verse 22. The first constitution of the Jerusalem Ecclesia, and no doubt all subsequent constitutions, was based on the principles of continuing steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers, we learn in Acts 2 verse 42. The Corinth Ecclesia was to keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. And Titus was sent to Crete to set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city. Titus chapter 1 verse 5. Interestingly, they came back to Perga on the coast where Paul had been sick. After passing through Pamphylia, Paul obviously was a lot better, for on this visit they stayed for a while to preach the word. Taking ship from Italia, the port of Perga, after two years, Paul and Barnabas finally arrived back in Antioch on the Orontes River about AD 48. Here they rehearsed all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. The apostles took no credit for the results of their labours. God gave the increase. We should give them credit, nevertheless, for their incessant labours under considerable hardship, labours from which we still are able to benefit. The work of our brethren and sisters should be acknowledged and appreciated by us, even though we know that they do the Lord's work. And it is he who blesses the work and gives the increase. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labour, for we are labourers together with God. 
Paul says in the first of Corinthians chapter 3 verse 6 to 9. In an age when very few travelled, the ecclesia must have listened with amazement as they heard how remarkably the door of faith had been opened to the Gentiles. It had involved much suffering, for Paul could write without contradiction, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Galatians 6 verse 17 and 3 verse 1. Today, many around the world are able to read Paul's speeches in their Bibles, but very, very few see what he is really saying and believe in the way his first hearers did. The reason is that, unless the Lord opened the heart, they cannot understand. Acts 16 verse 14 is proof of that. How thankful then should we be to our Father that our ears and our hearts have been opened and we believe unto life eternal.